Welcome to episode 133 of the Clarity Compressed Podcast. My name is Paul J. Daly. I'll be your host today. And today we're going to talk about what happened when the Disney animators told Pixar that they weren't any good. We're making our way through the fog of life and Clarity is understanding where we are on the map. You are here. (laughs) (laughs) Let the good times roll. This is Clarity Compressed. We have an interview today, uh, an interview with a man named Brian Kramer, who's the general manager of a, a large Toyota dealership down in Naples, Florida. And you might think the reason I'm having him on the show is because he's in the car business, but that's not the case. Although the car business is a great business and you know that I'm in, into that quite a bit. But the reason I'm having him on the show is because I read an article that he wrote on LinkedIn. I was scrolling through LinkedIn like I always do. And I caught an article and it had a picture of a scene from Toy Story 4 where Woody and that little spoon, that little spoony guy. So I started reading this article and when I got to the bottom, I realized it was written by somebody in the car business. And the reason the article got my attention because it was about change and about innovation and about people's fear when something is different, their desire to keep things the way it is and not change and not pivot. And I think really relevant is this this time period that we're in of COVID. Everyone's being forced to change in the midst of their fears, in the midst of the uncomfortable, because there's no other choice. And so my conversation with Brian, we talk about this principle and leadership. We talk about uh, leadership in general, what it is to give clarity to your team. He tells a story about when he was 19 and he ended up across the table from the CEO of the Ritz Carlton. This 19 year old kid tells uh, the CEO of the Ritz Carlton, oh, come on, is it really that great? And if you know anything about the Ritz Carlton service, either way, I'll let him tell the story. But I hope that you enjoy this very real conversation about why people are afraid to change, what innovation means, and how you provide clarity to your team to get them there. Here's my conversation with Brian Kramer, the general manager of Germain Toyota of Naples, Florida. Brian, thank you so much for uh, giving us some time and some time to the Clarity Compressed audience. No, I appreciate it. It's, uh, I'm a huge fan, Paul, so I appreciate you having me on. Oh man, it's my pleasure. Uh, it's very, it's very rare that I come across people the way I came across you. And I'm really just, I want to ask, talk a little bit about what got you to this point, because like most people that are in the car business, a lot of us didn't start here. You know, it found us more than we found it and we kind of stumbled into it. So why don't you just give us a, a little summary of like where you grew up, how you ended up in the car business, like what you did throughout your professional career and uh, just get us to this point. Perfect. So I grew up on the South side of Chicago, uh, when Ended up going to high school in, in Columbus, Ohio. Went to Ohio State for one day. I dropped out. I was a, uh, in high school, I was a lot porter at, at an Oldsmobile dealership. For wait, 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 wait. wait, wait, wait. I, I, usually, I usually don't interrupt people when they just get started. <clears throat> but wait, you went to Ohio State for one day. What happened on the one day that made you drop out? <laughs> I don't want to incriminate myself, but I, uh, <laughs> I ended up kind of drifting off. And uh, next thing I knew, it was like a day later. And ah. I figured I mean, it's gonna be hard to explain where I was. Gotcha. So ended up just uh, understood. Saying, I'm gonna take some time off. And I'll try I'll hit the reset button and try this again. All right. Okay, good enough. We'll keep moving. <laughs> We're, okay. I wish it was I mean, actually, it's an exciting story, but not maybe appropriate for all ages. All so so I did. So I was a lot porter at this Oldsmobile dealership. And Ended up, uh, you know, selling cars shortly thereafter, and I did pretty well. Then I eased up, got fired from the first job. Uh, ended up working for somebody else. Became an F and I manager at 19. Uh, worked my way up. Ended up becoming a sales manager at 21. I was a GM of a Mercedes dealership for the Germains at 24. Uh, they took a huge chance on me, and I probably wouldn't have done the same. Ended up running two dealerships, a Cadillac dealership, Mercedes dealership at 26. And then when I was 30, I, I left left and went to AutoNation where I got my doctorate degree. There's a, a ton of smart people at AutoNation. One of the things when I read the article you posted on LinkedIn that I referenced earlier in the intro of the podcast, um, it really caught my attention because I think 
regardless of the fact that, you know, I spend a lot of time in the car business, I spend more time in business in general, more time thinking about company culture, thinking about leadership, thinking about uh, innovation and transition. And so when I read your article, I realized, you know, like we understand, we understand each other. Um, and so why don't, why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, what spurred on you writing the article? I was reading a book called Creativity Inc. by Ed Catmull, who's one of the founders of Pixar. And I was watching, you got it up there? Totally unscripted. Totally unscripted. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's crazy. But that, that book is amazing. And that book, you know, because they were so far ahead of the car business. Car business is always like 10 years behind, you know, music industry and airlines yeah. and everything like that. So that is a great roadmap that I'm going down or I'm, you know, in the Starbucks story, same way with how, what they did with their app, because they were doing in 2010 what we're doing in the car business today. That's right. And that's that's where I got it from. Then I saw it again on uh, the Pixar story. It was on Netflix. And I said, there, there's so many parallels with people not wanting to adapt to change. And Pixar, you know, Disney wouldn't have had to spend $7.8 billion, you know, basically just listen to their associates because they had great ideas and that's the right. technology. That's right. So John Lasseter, who ended up, being the CEO of Pixar, was an animator in the early 80s for Disney. He had some great ideas. They went to Lucasfilm, where he met Ed Catmull, and he tried to get a joint project going with Ed and went back to the Disney Studios, where he worked with Tim Burton and a bunch of other great up-and-coming animators. But they had these nine grumpy old men, uh, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, and these animators from Disney, and they didn't want to change. And they said, look, computers isn't where it's at. That's not animation. The only reason you do that is you want to do it cheaper, faster, because it's never going to be better. So he said, well, I was talking to some people at Lucasfilm. Maybe we could do a joint project. And they got offended, threatened by it, so they fired him. So he left, started his own deal after Lucasfilm, and teamed up with Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs says, surround yourself with great people and let them tell you what to do, which is what he did. And he sold it 18 years later back to Disney for $7.8 billion. Typically speaking, the story about Disney and the animators, you know, and Disney having to buy Pixar and all that, like those animators, I bet they didn't hang around. They didn't stay around. They didn't make the transition. I think that they were stuck in their ways. I've actually watched a lot of business in times of innovation, the car business especially. A lot of dealerships that transition to a different way of doing things often lose 70, 80, 90 percent of their sales staff because there are still other people doing it the old way and they can't be brought along. Why do you think it was so different at your store? Let's talk about the transition that's happened in the consumer mind. And I don't think this is just limited to auto, but I think auto is a great example of it. When people are buying a car, you've seen thousands of them. You've processed and transacted thousands of times over your career. What are the things that the people really want to walk away feeling? What do you want that person walking away feeling? That they would recommend and they would return. Those are the two heavy hitters. And for a long part of my career, we didn't look at it like that. It was, you know, no such thing as a be back, buy or die. If you get a tip TO at four times, which is a turnover, get managers involved. If the company has a very profitable transaction, but I feel great about it as the consumer, everybody wins, right? It's a total win-win. Now, if I feel good about it, that means I feel like I got value. I have more, I got more value than what I paid, right? And if I walk away feeling like that, it doesn't matter what you make. It doesn't matter. All day long. Right? But but it could it could be the opposite, it could be true where everybody loses, right? Like I as a consumer could negotiate my brains out, get super frustrated, get a lower price. You made no money on the deal, and we're both upset. John Meloshenko, who's with the Jermaine Group. I don't think you know him. I, I don't he, know uh, him, but but uh, probably a mutual friend of ours, Dale Pollack, speaks so highly of him. I've probably heard him say his name several times. I've never met him, though. So I was uh, a real pain in the ass for him because I was not – he was all about structure, organizational strategy. I was a frustrating person working for him, but he had a tremendous effect on me when it comes to being organized, planning my day. Dave Kaler from Auto Nation was – and Jim Bender were – really tough on non-negotiables mm -hmm. and if we say we're going to do something and we make a promise you keep that promise you got to figure out what's most important to you mm -hmm. and stand for something and if it comes down to it there's no right way to do the wrong thing mm -hmm. as my gsm says i love that and that's kind of the mantra of the store rick germain introduced me to a guy named horace schultz when i was 19 years old the founder of the ritz carlton hotels and i had never experienced something like that you know, I was just having to sit at the same table at that dinner that night. 
And I said, well, you know, everybody, I'm sure, in the building doesn't treat customers the way you're talking about it. And he looked at me like he was looking through my soul. And he said, our dishwashers wash dishes with excellence, Brian. Do you understand what I mean by that? And I'm like... Uh, you, were ni- every- you said you were 19? <laughs> 19. And, you, and you're, you're cynical here. <laughs> this is great. So here we go. 19-year-old Brian Kramer sitting at the dinner table with, with the CEO of the Ritz-Carlton. And he's giving you Ritz-Carlton, right? We're ladies and gentlemen. Right, serving ladies and gentlemen, right? We're, yes. and, and you're like, come on, man. Everybody can't possibly do that. And he looks at That's you. <laughs> I mean, it was, I've never seen something. I'm like, oh my God, this guy is serious, like real serious. And then I got it. Yeah. And Steve Germain, Rick Germain's brother, one time I was giving him a hard time and he said, okay, I want to show you what good looks like. And he, we got in, on the airplane and we all flew down to Park Place down in Texas. And we took a look at the Sewell organization. We took a look at the Park Place organization. And he said, this is what excellence looks like. You just haven't seen it yet. And he was right. And I didn't know what that kind of experience, that people offered that kind of experience in the car business. And it was inspiring. How often is that, though? Like, that's a great point. You know, it's really tough to imagine what something would look like until you see it. Like, once you see it in life, that's so many. It, it applies in so many areas. The four-minute mile was impossible until it was broken. Right. And then in the and next in the next right year, through. right, people just start breaking it because they saw it was possible. When you see someone like an incredible musician, when you see an amazing artist, when you see they'll probably talk about used car turn. Right. How fast how fast and efficient can you be with your inventory? No one would ever believe it's possible until someone shows you the way. Growing up, we grow up with all types of experiences, different parenting, different examples. And until you see someone handle a tough situation with calm and eloquence and effectiveness, you would never believe that you could even do it that way until you watch it happen. And then that kind of can trigger this little aspiration within you to say, oh, well, I can do it too. So that experience you're talking about is is very real in the sense that was the first time you saw excellence. Yes. And I didn't even know excellence like that even existed. Right. I'd never been to a restaurant like that, a hotel like that. I didn't even, it was a lot to wrap my mind around and mm-hmm. I had to figure out more about it. And it was, it's real and it was genuine and sincere. And he lived that. And I'm trying to carry on a percentage of that mm-hmm. here with the people here because we've got great people, but they have to be inspired by us as leaders. When I went to the Disney Institute, there's an example of a uh, technician working on the carousel in Fantasyland, mm-hmm. and a little girl walks up to ask him where Mickey Mouse is, and he goes, "He goes, can't you see I'm doing my job? I can't. I got to get this thing fixed. Or you're not going to be able to ride it." Well, they have safety, courtesy, show, and efficiency. Mm-hmm. He was being efficient when he should have been courteous, which is an out of bounds marker at Disney. Right. And I think that for a long time I didn't provide the clarity. Well, I know that because I, I learned it the hard way. Yeah. As I told you earlier. But yeah. I didn't provide enough clarity, and you can't ever provide enough clarity to your associates. Yep. And most of the time, if you hire good people, we're the problem because we didn't tell them what to do Publix, the grocery store down here. They tell everybody, if somebody wants half a head of lettuce, you cut it in half, and they t- do it during the onboarding. So we shortcut the onboarding in the car business, mm-hmm. most industries, I'm sure. Yeah. Then we get frustrated with the associates. You should know that. You've been here for three months or a year. How could you not know that? Yeah. Well, they only know what we teach them. I think it's Bob Knight. Might be wrong. Uh, Bob Knight, college basketball coach, used to like totally lose his mind. He's one of those guys. But I hope, I think it was him. But either way, very renowned basketball coach said, if they're not doing it, you didn't teach it. And what he meant by that, he said, I could spend all week teaching guys that we're going to box out. And we could have practiced boxing out from, you know, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. at practice every day, all week. If we get to the game on Saturday and they're not boxing out, I didn't teach it, meaning I didn't make the intention clear enough. And I love that level of accountability and ownership. I do try to employ that in my, you know, when I'm leading and it's, I'm not always successful in doing it, but I try to hold my other leaders to that standard. I try to hold myself to that standard. It's easy to blame. It's easy to blame other people and be like, oh, you should have done this. I told you that you should have done this. I told you that, oh, we lost this client. Well, that's your fault because you didn't do this. And now all of a sudden I'm not responsible for it. But when I say, okay, if you're, not, if you're not doing it, I didn't teach it. And that means whatever I did wasn't enough. And so I love that mentality of taking ownership and that hierarchy and bringing clarity. I mean, obviously I talk about clarity, but there's this element of ownership when you're a leader. 
that it, it seems like all the great organizations that you're talking about, <coughs> including the Germain Group, and the fact that you oh, had a great customer experience and that your sales team was able to transition from the old way to the new way, they didn't do it because it, it felt good to change one day. Most people are wired to not change. I mean, there's some of us that like enjoy some elements of change and is exciting, but like three quarters of the population is not that personality type. So you've got to be able to pivot and be able to look at it through the customer's lens. And most of us are advertising it, but when it comes down to the execution of it, mm -hmm. do the sales managers, F and I managers, sales people all say the same thing when you know when they're in a room together, mm -hmm. uncoached, mm -hmm. which is typically the problem because one manager does it one way, another manager does it one, another way. So getting everybody in the room, mm -hmm. okay, we're going to do this one way, and I really don't care what way it is, mm -hmm. but it's going to be the same way because typically sales manager that doesn't want to do it that way, they go, yeah, but this one unique situation, and Jeff Bezos looks at the aggregate, he looked yep. at it with that with three returns, they wouldn't be Amazon. Doing what you say we do, it's easy until until you're about to lose, right? It. Like <laughs> it's easy until you personally have to say, I'm gonna lose. And that's in every area of life, right? You could solve you just find yourself there like when it comes to your kids. You went to work, you had a long day. Tragedy after tragedy at work, you dealt with it. You got home late. You missed dinner. You're just exhausted. You have a headache. And your kid says, Daddy, you said you would play this game with me when you got home. That's going to hurt in the moment, right? And you, you kind of sound like a douchebag and like me even saying that, like, oh, I don't want to do that, right? But every parent in this room knows what that feels like when the kid says that and the last thing you feel like doing, right? You're like, we'll play. We'll do it tomorrow. It costs something to do it right then. It costs your comfort, your sanity. But you know what? When your kid knows that you mean what you say, you get a lifetime of trust with that kid. So before you know it, that eight-year-old is 17. There's a guy involved that she shouldn't be with, and you see it, and she doesn't, and you tell her. You go all the way back to you doing all the things you said. And it's all going to come back in that moment. I know we're talking like big, big picture, but it's the same way whether you're talking trust in a business or trust with your kids, doing what you say. Like I have this saying, I say it's simple, but not easy. Simple. I said I would do this. I do this. Easy. Not so much, right? Because it comes at a cost. Right, whether you like it or not. If one year from now, you look back on the year and you're able to say, man, that was an amazing 12 months. What has to happen in the next 12 months for you to be able to look back and say that? A, my kids have to be able to socialize with friends and have their life go back to normal so we can do normal things. I hear you. I say that's, that's the number one thing. From a business standpoint, we've got to remove all the friction that everybody says, you know, you never waste a good crisis. But this is, this is one that's going to be a huge tipping point. Yeah, right. It's not the easiest way. Ne neither was Pixar. Right. right. Like, sorry, it wasn't that wasn't the easiest way. But once they got the hang of it, boy, did it turn into something. So right? I on, if they would have just got John Lasseter involved earlier mm -hmm. at Pixar, mm -hmm. they could have the management there should have sold the nine grumpy old men on what they they, they could have been a part of Toy Story. That's they right. They could have been a part of Up. That's right. They could have been, well, that's the real crime that was committed. That's right. They did they did they didn't give them the vision they needed. They didn't lead them through it. They let them steer the ship, and they didn't know what was best for themselves in that situation. Parting question. What do you want people to say about you when you're gone, or even when they don't work with you anymore? When people part ways from you for whatever reason, how do you want to be remembered? What are they going to say about you that you would like? The same thing that I say about Rick Germain and all, and all the other mentors that I mentioned, John Miloshenko, Dave Kaler, Jim Bender, uh, Mike Marudi, that I would not, and this is the Simplest way to say it, there is a 0% chance that I would be where I'm at today if it wasn't for those people. And I hope that someday somebody says that about me, that they wouldn't be in the position they're at. The, and I didn't always enjoy, I definitely didn't enjoy a lot of the lessons that I was taught by them, <laughs> but I do now. So I hope that someday a lot of the lessons and things that I put people through, that, that they look back at the same way that I look on everybody I mentioned. That is a great parting line. That is a great thing for people to say about you. I love it. Brian, thank you so much for giving some time to me, to the audience today. I know you're busy. You've got people running around probably all around you, taking care of the people in Naples. I just want to say thank you. Cool. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So that last line, when I said, how do you want to be remembered? His answer to that was pretty impressive. It was impressive because of its brevity. If people were able to say, I never 
would have been able to make it to where I am today if it wasn't for that person, that's a pretty awesome thing to say about somebody. I want people to be able to say about me that their lives were better off because of the time they spent with me. I like to try to keep it equally simple. I, it, I can't quantify what that actually means. It'll mean something different for everybody. I want my wife to be able to say it, my kids, those who know me best, the people that have worked for me in my companies, the people who are friends, acquaintances, the people at Starbucks that I see every day. I want them to be able to look at me, think of me maybe when I'm gone or when no longer part of their life or when they think back, say, my life was better for the time I spent with him. And so with that, I'm going to close. I hope that you are also able to say that because of the time we get to spend together, whether it's on the podcast or via social media posts or some interaction in the comments. I hope that in some way my work contributes to your work and vice versa. Until I see you next week or hear from you, I hope we connect on social media. Keep pursuing clarity. Keep inspiring other people and keep being courageous in the face of of this crazy unprecedented change. I will see you next week. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Don't blink. Don't blink. Get ready. Get ready.